we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Sue Park. I am the council president um, of the Council of PTAs here in Frisco. Um, if you're not familiar with our council, we are comprised of 65 PTAs around the district, um, and we are the support for those 65. We have 1,200 PTA leaders, and those are who we help train and we help out whenever, um, whenever they need our help. Um, last year, we had, over, we had almost 26,000 members here in Frisco, and in Texas, we had over 514,000, um, and but still we have over 5 million students that still need a voice, right? Um, Texas Pete, we, we were excited to get that. We are a grassroots association, so that means we gain our strength by our numbers, and that means members. So we hope if you haven't joined your local PTA yet, that you do join because this last legislative session really proved that our voice really can be heard by the legislators. The bigger, the, the greater our membership, that means uh, the larger our voice is. In fact, on this very hot topic of, uh, of vaping, of anti-vaping, right? We're not supporting vaping, we're anti-vaping. But, um, but on this topic of vaping, we were very, we supported the SB21 bill, I think, oh, the SB21 bill, which um, is a movement to raise the age of all tobacco sales to 21. Now, you wonder why Texas PTA would get involved with a, a bill that, ha that affects 21-year-olds. Well, in high school, which is where this vaping problem is very rampant, right? In high school, we have 18-year-olds in there. Uh, our students, my child who is 15 at Memorial High School, can, may be friends or be in class with an 18-year-old, and, and they can get jewels from them. They can get the e-cigarettes. They can vape from. They can get these vaping products. So, but they're not most likely going to be friends with a 21-year-old. Right, so that is why the age raising the age to 21 is such an important topic. But we also need to know about vaping and the dangers of vaping, and we need to um, relay that to our students. This actually was a very hot topic. We went to Rally Day in Austin this last February, and we took a busload of student, two busloads actually of students. And this was their topic of choice. This is what they wanted to talk to legislators, and they went to legislators' offices to talk to them about vaping, how, what the problem was, and how raising the age to 21 would really help this out, right? Um, but I think that's um, – so I'm glad you are here. Oh, one, more, one more little fact. 95% of smokers – start before the age of 21. So again, 21 is a big, is a big number, right? Um, and we need to support. Um, Texas legislators did support raising the age to 21, but then I found out that they can, people can still get jewels under the age of 21 online. So we still have more work to do. So that's where your voice, your membership really comes into play. Now, I would like to welcome William Solari. He is Frisco ISD Student Support Coordinator, and he will be kind of our MC tonight. All right. Thank you, Ms. Park. <laughs> For coming. Uh, let me give you a little background as to where this whole program started. The um, Student Services Department back in February actually started looking at the issue and saying, okay, we need to do something for our students, for our parents, for our community in terms of vaping. So uh, we started looking around at different curriculums and that's how we found Catch My Breath. And tonight, uh, Patricia Stepanak, who is the um, youth e-cigarette um, prevention program coordinator is the one who's going to be talking uh, about the program. And then later we're going to have um, Aaron Miller talk a little bit about uh, some of the consequences for the school 
and the uh, consequences in school for the students. And then Deputy Chief Shielson is going to talk about the um, legal consequences. And then at the end, we're going to have a panel of all three of them, and that's when you'll be able to ask questions. We'll have a question and answer period. So we ask that you please just keep your questions till the end. Um, so Patricia has a Master's of Public Health with an emphasis in health promotion and behavioral sciences from the University of Texas Health Science Center and a Bachelor of Arts in Communication in Spanish from Texas A&M University. Her love of serving the community and building a healthier tomorrow led to her public health, and eventually she ended up at the Catch Global Foundation. Uh, well, when she's not trying to uh, serve the community, she's often out running uh, the trails of Austin and also volunteering with uh, different organizations in Texas. So, Patricia, I'm going to turn it over to you. How do y'all? Um, thank you. So you're all here for a reason, and I don't think it's to preview the Oscar movies for next year. Um, I have been working on this project for a little over a year. I did some of my master's research on this exact program with Dr. Stephen Kelder down at the University of Texas Health Science Center, Austin campus. He created the program. He's our principal investigator. He recently won an, a National Institutes of Health grant to do a randomized controlled trial for this program. Um, so we're really excited. We're really jazzed. And we're here ultimately to emphasize that we're a community. This is a really scary issue. It can feel very isolating, but it doesn't have to be. Every single person in this room is here and we're all on the same team. We want to end the youth vaping epidemic. We want to mitigate the long-term effects. I'm sure you guys have seen some headlines in the news recently and we'll talk about those. Um, but we want to make sure that we put the health and safety of our kids first and foremost. So I am going to start with a little vocabulary lesson. Um, these next two slides are kind of just general terms that um, appear again and again. I'm sure you've heard them in the news. You might have heard some of your students talking about them or seen some of these products and devices out in the wild. I've got a little menagerie of vapes that we can do a show and tell towards the end. Um, but the first one I'll talk about is e-cigarette or electronic cigarette. And that is kind of the big blanket umbrella term for any type of vape. It could be a jewel, it could be a sworn drop, it could be a dab pen. They're all electronic cigarettes and they are products designed to simulate the act of smoking. So they have typically have nicotine in them. That's really what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, they have a battery. You bring the device up to your mouth, you inhale, and then you exhale, right? The next thing is vaping. That's the verb. That is the big blanket verb that goes along with e-cigarettes. So again, a jewel, a sworn drop, a dab pen, you're vaping, right? And it's called vaping because a vapor, and we'll get into that a little bit, is created and that's what you inhale and, and exhale, right? Jewel. Have you guys heard of jewel? Yeah. A lot of head nodding. So Juul is the most popular type of e-cigarette on the market right now. They control about 75% of the e-cigarette market share. They're a multi-billion dollar a year organization. Um, and they, as I'm sure you've probably heard from your students and maybe your students' teachers are more than likely what is found um, in possession of kids on campus. But it looks like a little USB drive. I've got some pictures in here that we can talk about. And it's a pod-based system. So the idea is that once you use up the pod, you throw it away and you start another one. Jeweling is the verb that is specific to jewel. So you could ask somebody that uses a jewel, do you vape? Do you smoke? And they say, no, I jewel. And we as a scientific community cottoned on to that and changed some of the surveys and changed how we were asking questions of young people specific to e-cigarette and vape use to include jewel and jeweling. And that's when we saw a huge spike in the use rates because we, we weren't asking questions the right way. Um, a jewel pod, like I mentioned, it's, it's a little teeny tiny thing that's got the nicotine based liquid in it. One jewel pod contains the same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. So that is a really fun fact. If you smoke a jewel pod a day, you are a pack a day smoker. Um, the next thing, nicotine. We've all heard of nicotine. It's really, really addictive. It is toxic. It can be colorless or yellow more often than not. Um, and it is highly addictive on um, 
when you put out substances on addiction potential graph, the only thing more addictive than nicotine is heroin out there. So it's really, really easy to get addicted to nicotine in very small doses. Um, the other thing to kind of note about nicotine is it can be absorbed through the skin. So if you're a teacher out there or you're a parent that might find some of these things in maybe not your student, but one of their friends' backpacks or some things, be careful. If you find out on the street, use gloves, use a paper towel, a Ziploc bag to pick it up because you can get that nicotine contact high and it's really not a fun sensation. Okay, vapor. We've all boiled water at some point in our lives, right? We know if it's a liquid and you boil it, you get it hot enough, a vapor occurs. And that's what happens with nicotine liquid. You get it to a certain point, a vapor occurs, and that's what you inhale. That's why it's called vaping, right? But the caveat to that is it's really not a vapor. It's an aerosol. And it's an aerosol because there are lots of other ultrafine particles in that vapor, that cloud, like nickel, like lead, like benzoic acid, like propylene glycol, um, diacetyl, all these really wonderful things that you're like, mm, I don't necessarily want to put those into my body. But think of an aerosol like hairspray. If you, your spouse, your partner, anyone in your life has ever used hairspray in the bathroom over time, you notice the countertop and the mirrors get kind of sticky. It's because there's other ultrafine particles. Now think about inhaling an aerosol in your lungs. It's sticking to your lungs. It's sticking to your liver. Okay. Um, e-juice is the, it's kind of the blanket term, e-juice, e-liquid, nicotine liquid, all fall under the same category. Some vapes, like Juul, are a pod-based system, and the nicotine is contained in that, and Juul, for a long time, only had one concentration of nicotine and recently came out with another. Or it could be a tank-based system, like a mod or a swore and drop, where you can kind of choose your, choose your flavors, choose your own adventure for your vape, and you put in the liquid there, and you go to a vape shop, and you can mix up flavors or say, I want a different nicotine concentration, and go from there. And then we have combustible tobacco. So that's cigarettes, that's hookahs, that's pipes, that's cigars. All good. Okay. So where are we winning the battle? Yeah. Tobacco product used was down real low before e-cigarettes hit the market. I think before e-cigarettes hit the market in 2007, 2007 to 2010, we were at a less than 10% use rate for uh, tobacco products amongst youth. And then e-cigarettes came along, and that story changed pretty quickly. So... What we saw between 2017, we knew that e-cigarettes were getting into the hands of use, and we started seeing a, um, a rise in use rates based on these National Youth Tobacco Survey, which the FDA puts out, and the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey. Um, we saw a rise, but we didn't know why. And then, like I mentioned, we changed the survey, and we started asking about Juul and Juuling. And that's where we started seeing spikes again. So this graph talks about current use. So are you using this product right now? And it could be the time they take the survey, that's the very first day that they've ever tried it, or they could be a chronic user. But what we saw is 27% of high school students were currently using a type of tobacco product, okay? And that means that's not just e-cigarettes, that's cigarettes, that's dip, that's snuff, that's all those things looped into it, okay? Let's talk about e-cigarettes. So we reached epidemic proportions last fall, okay? And specifically for e-cigarettes, this graph refers to 30-day use. So think about other things that you've done in the last 30 days, riding a bike, going on a walk, going to the grocery store. Same with e-cigarette use. Have you used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days? And that's the question that we pose to middle school and high school students. And what we found in 2018 was that there are about 20, 21% of high school students using an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. That translates to roughly 3 million high school students across the country. It's a nationwide survey. And about 5% of middle school students, or about 600,000 middle school students across the country that have used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. It's kind of shocking, right? Making you a little bit uneasy? Okay. I'm sorry, but the rest of the presentation is like that, too. Um, so this is concerning, right? So middle school, wh what these ages are that we're surveying are grades 6 through 10 for this. Okay? The other thing to note is that if you are an e-cigarette user and you are a young person, and by young person we really mean like age 25 and under, you are four times more likely to become a dual user, that means e-cigarettes and combustible tobacco, within 18 months of starting. 
So you could be, I have, before I started working at Catch, I had a boss that was a pack a day smoker and she was on her vape all day. So it happens, okay? But it, it, it can be stopped and that's why we're here. We're here to talk about prevention, right? The other thing. So we wanna ask ourselves, why? Why is this happening? What's going on? So when e-cigarettes first came out on the market, a lot of people, adults included, thought that it was just flavoring and water. There's no water in any e-cigarette, zero. Other things vaporize, other things boil. Um, and especially for young people, so this is data that the FDA collected in 2015 of what young people thought was in their e-cigarettes. Two thirds thought that it was just flavoring and water. There's nothing else in there, and I'm sure you've probably heard it from your kids, oh, there's, there's no nicotine in this. Have you read the ingredients? Okay. There are, there's a small percentage, about 13%, that understand that, yep, there's nicotine in this. I get it. I'm still going to do it. There are 13% that are very honest and say, I, I, you know what? I don't know, but I'm still, still going to do it. Um, and then, you know, elephant in the room, yeah. You can use vapes to smoke THC oil and, and CBD oil. And there are some people out there that are really, they're cognizant of that. Um, but there, there was limited knowledge. And, and still, we, we kind of know what's in them, but if you look at the back of an e-cigarette box, again, you have ingredients, nicotine, propylene glycol, benzoic acid, flavor. Um, but it doesn't tell you how much of those things are in there. When they say flavor, they don't tell you red dye number 13 or rose flavor 47. Um, so that's, that's kind of concerning. We don't know, right? The other thing, marketing. How many of your kids are on Instagram or Snapchat or have ever watched a YouTube video? Okay, so these companies were real sly, real slick about it. And if you look at, I'm gonna keep harping on Juul, but if you look at Juul's advertisements when they first hit the market in 2016, 2017, they almost exclusively used young, beautiful people that looked like they were having the time of their lives using a Juul. And Juul's slogan is Juul, an alternative to smoking. Makes you think cessation, right? It makes you think that they're trying to help you quit smoking. They don't disclose all these other things and Juul hasn't gone through a proper test to prove that they're a cessation device. The other thing is you have influencers. So if you have ever heard of Game of Thrones and ever heard of Sophie Turner, she's an avid Juul user and she's all over social media using her Juul and so is her friend, Bella Hadid. So I know these are more prev prevalent names. My generation, Leonardo DiCaprio is an avid vapor, um, but they're out there. And Netflix has started taking money from Juul because in a couple of their shows and movies, these characters are using Juuls. So it's out there, it's prevalent. And you can't control what advertising you're seeing and you can't always control um, you know, when a celebrity gets photographed by a paparazzi and you can't always know or understand that somebody needs to put in hashtag advertisement if they're using it, if they're being paid for that post, okay? So when do we start? When do we start talking to our kids about this? When do we really hit them home? When I was in school, we went through D.A.R.E. and we went through D.A.R.E. starting, I think, in first grade. Um, for prevention for different types of risk behavior and gangs and all that kind of good stuff. So you went through D.A.R.E., gosh, I think I went through it all first through sixth grade, seventh grade maybe at the time, and you got a booster shot of D.A.R.E. every single year. So I like to think of prevention as like vaccines, like vaccines are a prevention, right? And with some things you get the first shot and then you get a booster until you're done with the series, you keep going, right? And it's the same with this. So what we're seeing is that in high school, grades 9 through 12, we have such high use rates for some of these products that prevention really isn't an option anymore. If you have a, you know, almost 50% use rate in grade 12, well, you're not preventing them. You, you've got to help those kids quit at that point. But if we can get to them in grade 6, where we're seeing just about a 10% use rate, then we can truly... Um, engage in a prevention effort. And the idea is that every single year between grades six and 12, they get some dose of prevention curriculum, some dose of information about this topic. Um, but the other scary thing is that if we're seeing a 10% use rate in sixth grade, fifth graders are doing it. 
So, and I'm based in Austin, Texas. That's where our, our company is based. And we get call. I mean, I was on the phone all morning before I, I, I drove up today, but we get calls from teachers, from parents, from administrators, from community organizations, from student resource officers all the time wanting to talk about our program, but sometimes just wanting to confide and saying, this is what's going on in our community. And we've gotten multiple reports of kids as young as grades three and four coming to school with vapes and selling them and using them. So be careful. Okay. All right. Now it's on to the fun part. All right. E-cigarettes. I will relate e-cigarettes to like your phones or your computers. You're either an Android or you're an Apple user, right? And the same with e-cigarettes. You're either a jewel or you're literally anything else. Okay. But under the hood of those phones or computers, everything's really the same when we break it down, right? All those parts are really kind of the same. And it's the same with e-cigarettes. So you start out with a battery because you have to make a cargo of room, right? You have to have something to power that sucker. And then you have a heater or atomizer in there, which gets the e-liquid hot, right? Because we can't create a vapor without heat. You have a cartridge or a tank, which is where the e-liquid or uh, e-juice is held. And again, dual, some, some devices are pod-based systems, so it's already contained. It's kind of already done for you. And some you put it in yourself. And then you have a microprocessor, which tells the heater and atomizer how hot to get, when to get hot, how much of the liquid to release when you're taking a drag, all that kind of stuff. So it all, all the parts are there under the hood. The, the car just looks a little different, okay? So we're gonna go through a little evolution of e-cigarettes, okay? So e-cigarettes first hit the market in the United States in 2007. And when they hit the market, it, that red box number one is kind of what they look like. So they looked, they felt like cigarettes. You kind of got the same nicotine hit as cigarettes. And the idea was those are disposables, is that once you used up all the nicotine liquid in that device, you threw the entire thing away and started again. And then we started caring about the environment a little. And then we evolved to box number two, which is a tank or a mod. And it's called a mod because you can modify it. You can break it open, change out the battery, change out the microprocessor, take a bigger hit. Um, if you're really curious, later tonight after your kids go to bed, there are things as national vaping competitions. So people win tens of thousands of dollars to boat, blow really big clouds or smoke rings or do cool tricks. Um, but that's what they typically use. The other things with those is um, you guys have probably heard of like batteries exploding. Unfortunately, a gentleman in Fort Worth lost his life earlier this year because his battery exploded in his face and he died in his car with his vape. That was a mod. So there haven't been any reports of a jewel or a sworn drop exploding or anything like that. And typically when they explode, it's because somebody's gone in there and modified it and, and not put it back together the right way. RJ Reynolds has been the only company to recall a battery. And I think that was in, if I recall correctly, 2017 but everything else is, is because somebody tampered with the manufacturer's product. So then we kind of evolve into something. So if you've seen a mod or, or um, a, a huge tank-based system, they're gigantic, they're expensive, they're not easy to conceal. Um, so the industry evolved and we get boxes three and four, a sworn drop and a jewel. So sworn drop, um, I had highlighters that looked like this when I was in school. Um, somebody earlier said it looked like a key fob, which is accurate. And then you get to Juul, and it looks like a USB drive. Charges in a USB port. I do a lot of talks. I do a lot of teacher trainings, primarily here in Texas. But one of the, my most favorite things that a teacher's told me that they've gotten from a student is, no, miss, it's my homework. I'm like, OK, it's interesting. Um, but the, the sworn drop and the jewel are easy to conceal. And like I said, I've, I've got a little menagerie of things that we can, you know, after, if you guys want to come up and, and look at them and hold them, they're, the jewel is really light. The jewel is really easy to conceal. It's slick. The sworn drop's a little bit heavier, but still you get that kind of, oh, it's a new phone. It's a new, it's a new toy. It's a new technology kind of feeling from it. Okay. Okay. So the other thing. Why are these so popular? Because of the flavors. So you guys have probably seen in the news recently that some states, New York um, being one of them, is doing a, a complete fla flavor ban. The FDA uh, and the current administration have started to recommend these things, but some states are taking action a lot sooner. 
And it's because most young people, 80% of people who start, start with a flavored product. Okay. And you can see how these things are packaged. They look like candy. They have really fun flavors like unicorn vomit, and cotton candy. Um, so you get people addicted. And if you have ever been a smoker in your life, if you've even taken one drag off of cigarette, you know that first drag is real nasty. It's not the same with an e-cigarette. Ooh, boy, is it ever smooth. Um, so you don't see the harmful potential. It's much easier to get started. It's much easier to keep doing it. And therefore, you have addiction. I talked earlier about the misperception that there is just flavoring and water in an e-cigarette. Right? There's no nicotine. Well, 99% of e-liquids on the market contain nicotine. And I always want to associate that as, like, think of gum, right? Think of even sugar-free gum. There's still a little bit of sugar in it, but it's not enough to count towards your, your MyFitnessPal caloric goal. It's not enough. It's, it's such a negligible amount, but it's still there. And it's the same with these devices. Is the, that 1% that was tested that didn't register as nicotine, it was such a low content that it, it, was, it was almost negligible. But for a young person, that's still something that can still start you on the addiction path. Okay. The other thing to note is last summer, the FDA put out a, a, a recommendation essentially that's supposed to go into full effect, I believe in 2020, but I think that they're moving it up. It, it's the nicotine warning label that you've seen. So driving up and down Dallas North Tollway, driving up and down I-35 or 635, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen e-cigarette advertisements on these billboards, Star Telegram, during football games and things like that. And these companies now have to put a warning label on everything. And that warning says, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an, ad an addictive chemical. The FDA mandates where it has to be placed, how big it has to be, the type of font that they use, the colors that they use, um, also that people know. And it's, you know, if you've heard of, in Europe, they put these um, graphic images on cigarette packages. It's the same kind of concept. Blah. Okay. So I mentioned this earlier, but in one dual pod is about one pack of cigarettes, one to two, depending on which studies you're looking at. Um, whereas most, most e-liquids that we're looking at are like two thirds of a pack, three quarters of a pack, half a pack of cigarettes. And Jewel testified in front of Congress. And if you really want to laugh and, um, have a good time after this presentation. I highly recommend go and look at Jules' testimony and watch it because one of the congressmen um, asked the CEO of Jewel, why is your nicotine concentration so high? And their response is, well, it's what our users want. Okay. The other thing to note is the Jewel's nicotine concentration is, is 59 milligrams per milliliter. Okay. Again, about a pack of cigarettes. That's three times higher than the European Union maximum that's allowed for nicotine without a prescription from your doctor. Okay, countries like Israel, where tobacco use is pretty widely accepted as a cultural practice, banned the sale of Juul as a result of the nicotine content being too high. It's only been in the past few months that Juul's come up with a lower concentration. It's, it's, it's a 3% instead of a 5, so 59 mil, uh, milligrams per milliliter is about a 5% concentration. Um, they've only recently come out with a 3% concentration, but that's still far too high. Um, but that kind of helped their sales. Because if you've ever known a smoker in your life, nicotine addiction is real nasty to kick. It takes about 6 to 14 quit attempts to quit tobacco. All right. And so what we saw with Juul is because of their crafty marketing, like I talked about, um, they absolutely obliterated the market. I mean, you look, this graph, for those of you in the back, um, went from August of 2017 to October 2018. 14 months, they went from 24 to 75% of the market share. It's a lot. Altria, if you're familiar with Philip Morris at all, or Marlboro, Altria bought a 35% stake in Juul at the end of 2018 for $13 billion. That's billion with a B. Every Juul employee got a $1 million bonus at the end of last year. They're opening brick and mortar stores in Dallas, Houston, and Austin. Coming to you 2020. Okay. They're out there, they're nasty, and they've got money. They've got big tobacco money. 
I gotta get better at this. Okay. So what we know is that nicotine and e-cigarette use is an unhealthy habit. And like we've talked about, there are a lot of stories in the news, um, that reflect that. Unfortunately, we saw the seventh death this week due, um, that's been correlated with e-cigarette use. We've seen almost 400 cases of pul of pulmonary lung illness that are related to e-cigarette use. The one common factor is e-cigarette use there. Um, and the other thing to note with nicotine is that our brains are still developing up until age 25. So we all in some way when we're bored are primed for addiction. And that could be Netflix, it could be Chip and Joanna Gaines, it could be nicotine, uh, but there's something in all of us, right? And some of us never get addicted to things like nicotine because we, we either don't pick it up or it's just not in us. Um, but a lot of people do. But what we found is if you don't try nicotine before the age of 25, 26, and you try it after, you're much less likely to become addicted. And thanks to Tobacco 21, that's what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to, to mitigate and, and close that gap and make sure that more young people aren't addicted to nicotine and tobacco products. So I talked about some of the fun things that are in e-cigarettes in the liquid. So propylene glycol is the big one. That's how they suspend the nicotine uh, evenly throughout the liquid. You have things like benzoic acid as like a preservative. You have diacetyl. If you've ever popped microwave popcorn in your life, diacetyl was a flavoring agent and subsequently caused popcorn lungs, which are polyps um, in these popcorn factory workers. You have fun things like nickel and lead. Um, You've got random flavorings, which we don't know the long-term effects of those on the lungs. These are flavorings that are safe to ingest. So if you love Starburst or Jolly Ranchers, it's the same flavorings that's in those that you can eat and let biology do its work. But we don't know what happens when you vaporize and inhale it. The other thing to note, formaldehyde. We've all heard of formaldehyde, right? Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. So when you vape, when you inhale this stuff, formaldehyde forms in your body. It's fun, right? It's great. Okay. So a couple like jarring health effects that we're seeing. The first one kind of came out and really hit us in April of this year. And that was a correlation of e-cigarette use and, and seizures occurring in young people. What we found kind of since then is that it, it, it was essentially nicotine poisoning. That's what was happening in these kids because it's such a high dose in such a quick amount of time and their bodies aren't used to it. Um, but what the FDA came out and said is in April, they'd, they had 35 cases reported and that's from 2010 to 2019. And the FDA is saying, you know, we're sharing this information because it's a public health concern, but we're looking into it. We don't know, but we want you to know about it. And then another press release came out in August. And between April and August, they had a, received another 127 reports of e-cigarette use in relation to seizures. So this is a little concerning. This is in addition to lung illness that is occurring. And, and this is what we're seeing a lot more of in the news because it's a lot more prevalent. There are a lot more cases that we can kind of um, reference and, and talk about. But there's a lot of severe pulmonary lung illness and what it looks like at first is pneumonia. So all these doctors across the country were like, why do we have so many pneumonia outbreaks? It's August. What the heck's going on? And then they started looking into it and they found that the one common factor stringing all of these people across the country together was e-cigarette use. Now the caveat to this is a lot of these um, people were a have a, a, a laundry list of other illnesses going on with them. It's the same with all these, these, these seven people who've lost their lives. They weren't just vapors. They, they've got other things going on with them, but it, it is red flag. It is saying this is interesting. Um, and with the, the same with the pulmonary lung illness, a lot of these people have other things going on with them. Um, but the other thing that we need to note is that typically what we saw is they were using THC-based products, which it, they're suspended in a different liquid than nicotine-based products, so it affects the body differently than a glycol would. So the, these are all things that we need to consider. It's not 
this is not a definite, this is not a, we've got to, you know, send out the, uh, the Minutemen and go after these. It's, we need to ask more questions and we need to get all of the data that we can in order to, to make a confident decision and, and ruling about this. So something that we get asked a lot is I'm a parent. How do I know if my kid is vaping? And that's a really difficult question because sometimes your kid is vaping and sometimes they're 15 years old. And if you have a teenager at home, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so the vaping symptoms, again, we're, we're really talking about nicotine-based products because that's our specialty. It's all nicotine world. It, it goes along with other nicotine addiction. So again, think of you know smokers in your life, people that use smoke to traditional combustible tobacco, how they get a little jittery, a little antsy if they, they can't go out for a smoke break, things like that. It's the same with e-cigarettes, but those symptoms are escalated. So you know your kids better than anybody else. What we want to talk to you about is, is looking for really drastic changes, immediate changes. So one week they're great, the next week something's off, okay? Um, so irritability, anger, um, slamming the doors, they can't get away to get a hit of their vape, things like that. Anxiety, and I know this is really hard. I was talking to a group of students earlier tonight, and they're in five AP classes. And if that doesn't cause anxiety, boy, I don't know what does. But again, it's, it's opening up that conversation, that line of communication with your child and say, something's different. Let's talk, okay? Other things are difficulty concentrating. And this is, um, classroom teachers really point this out a lot more because kids are looking for an out. Can I go to the bathroom? Can I go get a book from my locker? Can I conceal, um, you know, using my vape in my sweatshirt, backpack, whatever, all things like that. Change in hunger and eating patterns. So it's, it's really extreme weight change that we look for. And I always like to relate this to the 90s diet, uh, model diet of a Diet Coke and a cigarette. You know, smoking satiates your hunger. And so does this. So, but the other side to that is extreme weight change. Um, we probably all know people in our life that use food as a coping mechanism. So if they're very anxious about this and they're starting to eat more, then you see that extreme weight change, right? Um, something to note is, is mouth sores. This is really new, what we're seeing, but it kind of dries out the salivary glands, nicotine. Um, and then nosebleeds as well. It really dry, like if you've ever been to an ENT, it dries out that entire like na nasal cavity in those salivary glands. Um, increased thirst again, because all that's is dried out. It's a, uh, it's not easy. It's not fun. It sounds really silly, but an increased craving for tobacco or nicotine. So again, when can I get my next hit? What we're seeing with young people that are truly addicted is they can't go more than 30 minutes without getting a hit. And I'm, again, I'm sure you've known smokers in your day that were the same way. They need to go out. They, you know, so a lot of companies still have smoke breaks written into their laws or their um, company policy. The sudden interest of burning scented candles or incense. So that is trying to cover up that smell. E-cigarette smell doesn't stick around like combustible tobacco. It, it's kind of cloud. It goes away. It's sweet. It's fruity. And you're like, man, is there cotton candy around? No, it's a jewel. It's really disappointing when you want cotton candy. Um, and then sudden use of cheap perfume and cologne. Again, the, these last few are really anecdotal, what we've heard from kid, uh, schools across the country. Sometimes your kid is using a vape and sometimes they're 13 and going through puberty. Okay. Um, and then missing phone chargers. So e-cigarette chargers are really expensive to replace, but there are lots of YouTube videos out there um, teaching young people how to splice iPhone chargers to charge their vapes. So just be on the lookout, okay? So these are, this is from last summer. These are three national news stories that our program was involved in. And this is not to say, go catch my breath, we're doing awesome. This is to say, this is a national conversation and you're not alone. So I mentioned at the beginning that this can feel like a really isolating experience. It's scary and it doesn't have to be. Every single person in this room, we are all on the same team. We are all here. And if you're mad about this issue and you want to get involved, go PTAs, right? We've got, I live in Austin. I was there at rally day. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, but talk to your partner, your spouse. If you have older children that are in college, talk to them, talk to your neighbors, talk to your colleagues, talk to the school board, um, talk to your student resource officers, talk to the checkout person at Target. I mean, really get engaged in this so that you can understand that everyone around you is seeing this and everyone around you is affected by it. 
The e-cigarette epidemic doesn't know socioeconomic, racial bounds, geographic bounds. It's everywhere. Okay. So this is for um, 2018, 2019. Um, we were in 49 states across the country, except for Delaware, first state in the union, last one to use Catch My Breath. Um, we reached a little more than 1,100 schools and almost 330,000 students across the country. And that's our program. We're a four-lesson prevention curriculum. Frisco is doing this starting in October. Um, they have a unique approach that I'm really excited about because they're having students teach it at the high school level. So it's, it's going to be really great. Okay. So program impact. In 2017-2018, we were funded with a small pilot grant from St. David's Foundation um, to run in Central Texas and then a few other key states. And what we found is this is all middle school data because that's how our program started was middle school, so grades six through eight. On average across the country, there are about 192 students in a seventh grade class. I realize Frisco is a heck of a lot bigger than that. This is an average, okay? If we use the tobacco prevention curriculum as it's currently written, 17 of those 192 will try an e-cigarette in a school year. And 17 out of 192 doesn't seem like a lot. It's less than 10%, but that's still 17 more students than I want trying an e-cigarette. If this imaginary school were to implement Catch My Breath as intended, they would save eight of those 17 from trying an e-cigarette, or about 45%. It's pretty big. Woohoo! Okay. And if we add that up across the country, it's a little more than 153,000 seventh graders every year that will save from trying an e-cigarette. Okay. So something that we always love to collect is student feedback. And this came from a high school senior in Illinois who went through the program last year. And what this says is, I chose to do it, it being e-cigarettes, but after recent thoughts and ideas in this class have chosen to stop. So one out of 330,000 decided to stop using e-cigarettes because of our program. I did my job. I can go home. Um, I will reiterate that we are a prevention program. We are not designed to help students quit, but we do have students that go through it that are like, you know what, this isn't a great idea. Another thing that we heard, this is from an eighth grade student um, that decided to remain anonymous, is talking about their peers, right? So kids don't know the long-term effects. Stop now while you can. Great advice. When I first heard of vaping, I thought it was safer than cigarettes, but after the curriculum, I know all about the chemicals that are in an e-cigarette. And his thought of vaping being safer, that's something that we were all fed. We were all fed by the e-cigarette industry. Again, Jewel's slogan is Jewel an alternative to smoking. Okay. For free. Frisco's already doing this, so we're good. And this is me. That's it. I'll pass this along now. Um, we'll do questions at the end. Please save them. I love talking. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. That was excellent. Um, so I'm just going to talk real briefly about what we're going to be doing in Frisco. Uh, we're going to be implementing in October. We're going to start with um, three monthly classroom lessons for all secondary students. Uh, and the first lesson will be real informative. The second lesson is going to talk about refusal skills. And then the third lesson will have some health impact and things like that. So. Uh, Really what we're trying to do is basically get the information out to our students. After the three lessons are done in the spring, the broadcast teams are actually going to be making public service announcements. And those on the high school level, they're going to be geared towards our middle school students and shown at um, different district events and different schools and things like that. And at the middle school level, they're going to be making PSAs that are going to be geared for our fifth graders. So it's really about still doing the prevention efforts, but also on the high school level, we do have some cessation. Uh, we've gotten some feedback from some students, you know, I want to help my friend quit. What can I do? So we're getting those resources in the hands of our high school students as well. Um, all right, so our next speaker is Erin Miller. She's the Chief Student Services Officer for Frisco ISD. She's a graduate of Texas Tech, and this is her 16th year in Frisco ISD. She's been an English language arts teacher in both middle school and high school. 
She came to student services as the managing director for secondary student services before becoming the chief student services officer. Thank you. I'm really glad that all of you are here tonight. Um, Frisco ISD is committed to helping and dealing with this issue. Before I came to student services, I was the principal at Frisco High School. And so I had the opportunity to work very closely with principals and assistant principals. And one thing that we're doing that I think is really important is we're training assistant principals on how to look for what's going on in their campuses. We're bringing in people who can say, these are the things that are happening and this is what you need to be looking for. They can then train teachers on what to look for and we can help our teachers in the classrooms as well. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, we found that our assistant principals were contacting the office and they were saying, we don't know from a discipline standpoint how to deal with what we're seeing with all of these students who are vaping. Um, we want to make sure that we're equitable, we're treating students fairly. And so we started thinking about what should we do with discipline. We got together some middle school assistant principals, high school assistant principals, principals, student service coordinators, counselors, and we said, okay, what should we do? The philosophy of us with discipline is that you discipline a student to change the behavior. It shouldn't be punitive. It shouldn't just be punishment. It should be changing behavior. So what can we do when we're seeing these things happen on campus to help change behavior? So we created a matrix that would help campuses to remain equitable. We didn't say to campuses, you have to do this. Student is caught with a jewel, you must do this. We give the campuses some leeway because every case might be different. You need to give the student due process, talk to the student, ask them what's going on. But it could be that you want to um, give ISS, so in-school suspension, to a student for their first time for having a vape or a jewel on campus. But another component of that is going to be um, a restorative practice. So we might have them watch a video about vaping and then maybe answer some questions about it or read a paper and have a discussion with them about it. We want them to see what the effects are on their health, not just stick them in in-school suspension or send them home. So we want to make sure that we have that component. Something else that we've added is a parent component. We've, been given, um, we've given resources to the campuses so that when a student has a discipline incident, we can send resources home to the parents. So the parents can also look through and see, this is, this is what you should be looking for. This is what it's doing to your child. Have a conversation about it. So that's, that's what happens. We're also very fortunate that we have school resource officers that are so committed to working on our campuses and to working with our administrators. So we will always get the school resource officers involved when we have students who are using vapes or jewels, and we're going to... Um, allow them if they want to to speak with a student. It's up to their discretion if they're going to take this um, to a legal aspect to it. That's going to be the school resource officer's discretion. If they choose to do that, then that's a Class C misdemeanor and a court referral. So that's something else that can and may happen when a student has that on campus. So that's just a general overview of campus discipline. Um, something to keep in mind is, again, we're only talking about nicotine. If we start talking about THC, it's a completely different conversation. A student possessing THC on campus, that's a felony offense. And so with that felony offense, we're looking at an expulsion to the JJAEP. We have our SROs who can field test the liquid and determine if it's THC or not, and then we can make the determination that that is the elements of a felony on campus and expel to JJ. We have a lot of students who are not aware of that. They don't think that they're going to get expelled for THC. And in fact, that's something that we do according to the law. So nicotine, THC, a completely different conversation. Okay, that's a general overview, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Thank you, Ms. Miller. All right, um, our final presenter of the evening is Deputy Chief Shielson. Uh, he started with Frisco Police Department in 2012 and has been in law enforcement since 1999. In his career, he served in nearly every aspect of the police department. 
He has a master's degree in public administration from the University of Texas at Arlington, a Bachelor of Science degree from Texas A&M University in political science, and an associate's degree from Blinn College in criminal justice. He is a graduate of the FBI National Academy 243rd session, a graduate of the Bill Blackwood Law Enforcement Management Institute of Texas, and a senior management and the senior and management institute for the police 70th session. You've been in school a long time, sir. Thank you. He, he made me sound really smart. <laughs> so, uh, like you said, my name is David Shilson, and I am over our uh, investigations bureau, which is responsible for all of our SROs that we have here in uh, Frisco ISD. And so what I'll say is one of the great things that we have going for us in our SRO program is we have a great partnership with the school district. And so uh, that's what brings us here tonight. And uh, kudos to Frisco ISD for uh, you know, this, this curriculum, this uh, prevention curriculum, because um, this, this is something that we do uh, certainly need to get a handle on. Um, I took over uh, as deputy chief over investigations uh, in January. And one of the first things that I did was I wanted to know what was going on in the schools. And so I took a visit to each high school and I talked to each high school SRO. And one question that I asked them was, what, what do you spend the majority of your time dealing with? And so the unanimous answer at every campus was vaping. And so I said, we've got a problem and we need to figure out how we can work with the school district and how we can, you know, curtail this issue. So that's what brings me here tonight. So I'm going to put these numbers up here. Um, these are kind of a, a calendar year. They're not a school year uh, measure of how many referrals that we've had. But you see that we're trending in the wrong direction, and that supports uh, everything that Patricia has said uh, on a national scale. So um, I, I'm... I'm not telling you that we're doing some big e-cig crackdown in the schools. So this is not because we're uh, making this our primary focus with our SRO program. This is just what we're finding and, and what, what is presenting itself to the school resource officers um, day to day. So you see that we're trending in the wrong direction. Um, referrals this year were a month into the school year, and we're up to 46. Um, and so uh, I know this article is real kind of real small, but um, this just supports uh, a lot of what Patricia said uh, on a national scale. You know, you, you're dealing with uh, an epidemic across the country. And, you know, in the last 30 days, it's now estimated that, you know, maybe 25% of high school students have uh, used an e-cigarette. So um, numbers coming out to support, you know, definitely we're trending in the wrong direction. 450 documented cases of lung-related issues related to vaping and six deaths. So certainly something that we don't want to experience here in Frisco, which is uh, what we're all, why we're all here tonight. This is the law uh, that Sue referenced initially uh, when, she, uh, when she kicked us off. I know that's really small, um, but this is basically the possession law related to uh, e-cig and tobacco possession by a minor. Okay? This is found in the Health and Safety Code. Um, this was just revised, and you'll notice it says up here, if you're younger than 21 years of age, you've committed an offense if you possess an e-cigarette. So um, this is a Class E misdemeanor, so this is something we would do a referral for. And, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, kudos to the PTA group for supporting this legislation because hopefully, uh, you know, you know, our goal isn't to be heavy-handed with our enforcement. I would, I would love to see zeros up there when we're talking about um, e-cig referrals or vaping referrals. Um, our goal is to hopefully, you know, educate students, educate parents, and, uh, you know, so they stop, they stop doing something that's very harmful to them. So this is a Class C misdemeanor to be in possession of an e-cig, um, and that's found in the Health and Safety Code. So um, Aaron referenced THC, uh, and it is much more serious, okay? Uh, the THC vape liquids are found under Penalty Group 2 uh, of the Health and Safety Code. 
and uh, they start with a state jail felony. That's a one gram amount uh, is a state jail felony. Now, the other thing that may be available, depending on the circumstance, is uh, there are enhancements to possess uh, controlled substances under penalty groups on a school campus. So those enhancements might take us up to a, a third degree felony. Okay, just to give you an idea of com maximum confinement ranges for a state jail felony, uh, anywhere from 180 days to two years confinement. Uh, a third degree felony is anywhere from two years to 10 years confinement. Okay, and there's fine components to that as well. So um, obviously much more serious, uh, and I'll explain why here as I go go through. But that's also found in the the health and safety code and. Uh, just know that THC vape cartridges or liquid are covered under penalty group two. So Patricia covered a lot of this stuff in, in her presentation. I just wanted to, to kind of show this to you, um, just kind of a lot of different examples of uh, vaping devices. Um, you know, one thing I'll share with you is she mentioned the story about the, the battery exploding and the death in Fort Worth, a 24-year-old that died. Uh, from exploding battery. From that, uh, it, it became such a concern about storing these at the police department. We don't store them at the police department anymore. Uh, we will not allow e-cig batteries in our property room because of the risk of explosion. So certainly another danger that probably wasn't even conceived when uh, people started using these products, but certainly a concern that we have. The other thing I'll say is there are you know, a lot of different shapes and sizes like Patricia mentioned, but just something to think about and ask yourself. If these products were really aimed at adults that were interested in uh, quitting smoking or an alternative to smoking, why do they make them so concealable? Why, why do they make them small? Why do they make them look like a thumb drive? Why do they make them, you know, Easily, you know, look like a key fob. You know, what is the point in that? And the only answer that comes to my mind is the fact that they're they're marketing them to children who shouldn't have them in the first place. And so that's just something just something to ponder. I, I just I don't understand why um, they're they're marketing a product that's really designed to be concealed. So, and as if these weren't enough. How about a vape watch, which a neighboring agency has actually found in one of their high school campuses? So we haven't seen this yet here in Frisco, but another way that you can conceal uh, an e-cig product, which is definitely concerning. So some pictures here that I'll show you. These are all pictures from Frisco cases, um, so things we found here. Patricia mentioned the contact high uh, or the contact uh, exposure risk from nicotine. Uh, you notice so our officers are always wearing gloves when they're dealing with this stuff. But just an example here of some photos. Uh, this is a key fob uh, e-cig. So it looks like a key fob. If I saw that, I would probably most likely think it belonged in a car. Okay. Whoops. So the THC vape cartridges, uh, Patricia mentioned that, you know, a lot of the, uh, the nicotine products look like candy. Uh, they're flavored. Um, same with the THC stuff, okay? What you're seeing here is packaged, th concentrated THC vape cartridges, okay? And for parents, it's just something to, to look at and be aware of. Because a lot of parents, I think, don't realize what this might be. They might look at it and think it's candy um, because of the way it's packaged. When in actuality, this is an illegal narcotic that's in penalty group two, which is a state jail felony. Okay? So just something for parents to be on the lookout. And like I said, this is something we've recovered here in Frisco, just one example. Some more examples. Um, you can see this is... More of what I'm talking about with, uh, you know, it looking like candy. These are one gram vape cartridges here. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, as a state jail felony to be possess one gram of a THC vape cartridge. If a student was to have more than one of these, we've moved up to a third degree felony. Okay, so it can escalate very quickly. And I can, 
you know, uh, there's we we have uh, pictures where there's just we've made arrests where there's boxes of vape cartridges, just boxes of them. Um, you know, we've had situations where we've made arrests for uh, dealers that literally had a constant stream of kids coming to buy, uh, and business has been very good for them. So what I wanted to talk about here, and I know you can't see this uh, in the picture, but these are THC vape cartridges, one gram cartridges. But one of the things that really is alarming here is traditional marijuana uh, concentration. So if you're talking about your, what you think of when you think of a joint, uh, the THC concentration in a joint is probably about 10 to 15% traditional marijuana on average. Okay. What you're looking at here, and these are two different examples, um, you're looking at, in this case, a one gram uh, THC vape cartridge with an 85% concentration for THC. Okay? Over here on the left uh, is a 92% concentration of THC. Okay? And what should scare you even more is um, this right here, which says... Uh, one serving, essentially, is a three-second uh, inhale. So this one cartridge contains 150 servings, okay? So we start, I'm not a chemist, and I'm not going to pretend to be, even though he made me sound really smart in the intro. Um, but essentially, one of these vape cartridges is almost the equivalent of about 900 to 1,000 traditional marijuana joints, Okay? And so when I talk to our narcotics detectives and I say, okay, so this should last them a while, right? A couple of days, okay? So when you think about, you know, the amount of THC uh, that kids are taking in when they're using this, it, it's substantial. I mean, and it's, it's really off the charts compared to what we've seen historically. So uh, we've had cases here where, you know, we had four students go to the hospital because uh, what happens is they, you know, they, they inhale off of one of these devices. They may not feel an immediate effect, so they inhale again and they inhale again, and before you know it, they have overdosed on THC, okay? And in the example I was speaking of, four different students, or, you know, four students doing the, hitting the same uh, e-cig, Okay. This is just a national example uh, of, of what I was talking about with pertaining to the uh, concentration. A lot of these THC vape cartridges, um, some of them, you know, it's kind of make your own, right? So even if it's something that's packaged, uh, you know, you refill it with your own mixture, and that could create a whole bunch of other problems. So um, certainly something that, like I said, all across all across the nation that uh, is, is an issue. So what's been the response? Uh, Michigan, you may have heard this, first state that's working on banning uh, e-cigs or flavored e-cigs. And of course, uh, Patricia mentioned that uh, there's a federal ban, hopefully in the works, on flavored e-cig products. Um, one of the things that I heard is that they're, uh, they're creating a guidance document uh, the, by the FDA that is creating some sort of a guidance document. The Centers for Disease Control are now tracking and trying to keep tabs on uh, how many vaping-related or e-cig-related um, cases that they deal with uh, coming into ER. So there's been, you know, reporting guidelines for doctors as they observe some of these things so we can get a better handle on the numbers. Uh, I'm, I feel pretty safe in saying that uh, as more word gets out, and as doctors become more educated on these symptoms, some of the things that Patricia mentioned, the numbers are going to skyrocket because now they're going to be looking for uh, these things to present themselves as they see folks come in. And then menthol has its own issue. There's a specific chemical, I can't remember the name of it, uh, in the menthol e-cig products that were causing a whole different type of, uh, type of issue. So if you want to write that email down or screenshot that, uh, that is the email address to our SRO supervisors. So 
if you have a concern or question about uh, e-cigs or vaping, uh, you can just send it to that email address. It will hit uh, all of our sergeants. It will include me. It will include our lieutenant. And then they can route it to the specific campus uh, that you might be inquiring about. So that's my portion. Thank you all very much. We're going to, uh, so far, three speakers wouldn't mind coming up. And uh, Baldwin here has a microphone. So if you have questions, if you would. And if your question is directed toward one of the uh, panel members, just please point that out. Or if it's just through them. Okay. Thank you. Test. Okay. Well, there we go. Yeah. I've got more of a comment or a suggestion. Um, I think it's a really good idea if you're a parent of a teenager to just go on Amazon and buy some drug kits. You can buy a nicotine drug kit and you can buy a like more a drug panel drug kit that would show the THC. I think you have to be proactive and not wait for the addictive symptoms to show up. Um, drug testing is simple as having your child pee in like a red solo cup. You take something, dip it in the urine, within five minutes you know if they have nicotine or have been exposed to nicotine. And you've also given your child an excuse not to vape because your kiddo can say, hey, every month, every 10 days, my mom dips my urine. I can't do that stuff. And I think that's what's most important in this day and age. So, did you guys give this presentation to the kids in school? Um, no. So, this presentation that I gave is specifically designed for parents, adults. Um, what we focus on more in the schools is information, general information about e-cigarettes, what are the dangers, um, talking about social norms, so the thought that everyone around me is doing it, so I should kind of do it too. And then looking at advertising, things like that, that's really what we focus on. We, uh, you know, sometimes in prevention, and, and you guys know this for other risk behaviors, you wanna talk about prevention, and sometimes you toe the line with exposure. And that's, you know, why we developed this parent presentation, so you guys can hopefully have that first conversation with your kids and with the really wonderful work you guys have been doing here in the school district, all of your kids are going to be exposed to this program. Someone else? Oh, oh. I have a couple of questions. First of all, can you clarify, is it now in the state of Texas anyway, is it illegal for the sale of these products to anyone under 21 or is it and or the possession of these products? So the statute that I put up there is the possession statute, okay? Um, the, the legislature in this last legislative term, um, there, there is a separate statute for the sale um, and purchase. Um, what I put up there was the possession, and it says that you cannot possess it under 21. Uh, I will say there's a little bit of confusion right now with uh, the sale of these products to someone who's under 21 uh, because in, the, in that particular statute, uh, there's a clause in there that may have grandfathered uh, people that were 18 prior to the law going into effect. Um, still a source of debate amongst a lot of legal experts because uh, this statute does not have that clause in it. And so as of this moment right now, um, I can refer to this statute as the possession statute and um, definitely say that it is illegal for someone under 21 uh, to possess them. Thank you. And second question, how can you tell the difference between a cartridge for a jewel or an e-cigarette and a thumb drive? 
It's a really fun Where's Waldo game. Um, it, it's just exposure. So if you, as a parent, have never seen these devices before, if you're here tonight, guess what? I've got a menagerie that we can all pass around. Um, but the other thing that I actually recommend doing, and this is what I did, is go into a vape shop. Tell them who you are. Tell them why you're there, why you're concerned. And my experience has been really positive. I, I live in Austin. I went on kind of a, a low point, you know, I think it was like a Tuesday at one. So there wasn't anyone in the shop, but the, the manager spent about an hour with me kind of explaining different products and, and what was popular at his store, what he knew from his clientele. Um, and you know, what his experience was with it. And so that was really in, informative from, for me, just getting to know what's going on in the community, but also seeing all the different things that are going on. I also recommend, I believe it is Tobacco Free California that has a, a, it's a short 30 second video and it's got a whole, it's a table full of school supplies and it says there's five e-cigarettes on this table. Can you spot them? And so organizations like Tobacco Free California, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, Truth Initiative, all have really wonderful resources to help parents out. Um, the FDA also has a guide out that says, essentially, like, I'm a parent and I'm concerned. What do I do? So I would direct you guys to those as well. So this question is for Ms. Miller or anybody else who wants to take it. Um, speaking to some of the police officers in the rural areas and the chiefs down there, um, field testing the for THC content or nicotine in the jewels is uh, very costly. Um, it kind of builds up, and then you're looking at thousands of dollars getting these things tested, and the turnaround's kind of slow. Um, is there a backdoor way of doing that? Um, what's y'all's method of doing that? I'm actually going to pass this down to you. I can tell you secondhand what I've heard from speaking with police officers, but I'd rather you hear it from the source. So there's been a lot of conversation about marijuana uh, and the requirement for quantitative testing, um, whether it's traditional marijuana or whether it's, uh, you know, THC liquid. Um, the city of Frisco just passed, um, just last, last or Tuesday, um, we're, we are contracting with a private lab, um, and we're going, to, we're going to send off to the private lab for quantitative testing um, marijuana because we need that quantitative testing to prosecute the case. Uh, the district attorneys need that, and so uh, it's not cheap. You're absolutely right. Um, but we as a community are, are not prepared to just, you know, turn the other way or say it's too expensive for us to enforce that law. So uh, we are going to spend the money and quantitatively test uh, for the THC levels. So I just have to add to that from the school perspective. Um, once they do the field test and we determine that there's THC there, then we look at it from the perspective of we have elements of a felony, we have reasonable belief that there is a felony, and so that's how we will then assign our discipline. So we're not going to need to wait the time it takes for them to get the quantitative test back. We actually look at it from a little bit different perspective. And so, yeah, the, the, the field test just basically tells us there's THC there. The quantitative test will tell us how much. So that, that'll kind of clarify uh, that. We need the quantitative test for prosecution. The field test really gives us the probable cause for the offense. Question. Uh, what are the ways and means that uh, this vaping is penetrating into the middle and high school? I mean, like, what is the sources that is one. And uh, the next question that I have is, like, I, I mean, like, it's, it kind of relates to what you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation. I mean, like, you me is it, I mean, like, how, how is the Fed not curtailing the introduction or the marketing into the, into the industry? I mean, like, it should be, first of all, curtailed into the market itself instead of focusing on the side effects and then going on to the teaching and all those things. So... I have a lot of questions lingering around that area. You bring up some really good points and some of my favorite questions to answer. So how is it getting into the hands of students? And I'm sure um, the wonderful people on either side of me can attest to what's happening here. But from what I, I, I deal on a national basis, um, and so what we've heard are a lot of creative things. So 
with T21 having just literally just been passed, um, 18 year olds buying these things and selling them in school. The to buy them online, age verification is already 18. Yes or no? Uh, Jewel has just put in a, a license, driver's license verification on their website, but I, I I'm not clear on if you have to have that same driver's license to sign for the package. And a lot of companies don't require that. They don't require driver's license verification like they would for an alcohol sale. Um, and then the other thing is, unfortunately, some of these vape shops don't card like they should. Um, so that's that's the other uh, part of it. Um, to speak to the marketing perspective, e-cigarette companies are literally copying Big Tobacco's playbook. So I mentioned when Juul first came out on the market, they were using really glamorous folks. I mean, beautiful airbrushed people um, to to sell these products, and they weren't alone. They were not alone in that, but the FDA did crack down on them and they did two raids in 2018 on Juul, specifically Juul on their marketing data and collected several million documents to analyze. And once the first raid happened, Juul said, ooh, we should probably change our marketing tactics. So Juul has since really limited their presence on social media. They have wiped their Instagram clean. Um, and if you look at their adverts now, it's people that look like they're in their mid forties, early fifties. They've got a senior dog with them. They're looking out on a lake, having a cup of coffee, talking about how they're having their best time of their life right now. Um, and, and a lot of e-cigarette companies are following suit because they are like, Ooh, we got caught, but we don't want to be prosecuted for it. So did that, did that answer some of your questions? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, are there any plans, or like, are there any being done for uh, installing the smoke detectors in the school uh, bathrooms? Because that's where I heard many of these vaping cases. Like in the airplanes, there is the smoke detectors, right? Is there anything in, in, in the plan to install like smoke detectors to find out? So, okay, so the question was asking about the devices that can be installed that detect actual vaping. And at this point, I can say that's something that the school district is looking into. We're trying to gain more. I think my question kind of... Um, mirrors that is are you guys running like drug dogs through the school and can they smell or detect THC in the vape Okay, so yes, we do have a contract with a company who um, randomly brings in the dogs to our campuses, and we have very strict guidelines for what we can and can't do with that. Um, the dogs will obviously hit on actual marijuana. I am not entirely sure. I, do you know if, they actually, if they'll hit on the THC oil? That is a wonderful question, and we're going to find that answer. <laughs> So once you find out, you know, somebody is using it, what is the regular normal protocol? I know you talked a little bit about it, but what is the regular protocol in a middle school or a high school? I mean, I suppose parents are contacted immediately. Uh, and, you know, what is, what is the process? I just want to understand, and of course, it depends on what, how, you know, how often they're doing it, or I, I don't know. THC sure. or not. Or okay. Do you, we want the scenario to be nicotine or THC? Both. Okay. So <laughs> let's start with a school or high school. Am I going to have to use my voice? Okay. Um, middle school or high school student, and let's say we find that they have a jewel pot on them. So we're going to bring them into the assistant.
Okay, am I on? Oh, hello. Um, my question is, I'm still focused on, um, and I know you talked a little bit about um, how the kids are getting them. I know that they can't just go to 7-Eleven, right? I mean, if you're a 15-year-old, unless you look 21, I guess, right, at this point. Um, so my question, I guess, is if you're in middle school or high school, are you guys, just from your experience, seeing more like, is are the 18-year-olds or now 21, right? That did pass. Um, are they doing it more like a drug deal? Like a guy's breaking out a briefcase yeah. and, you know, he has well, 20 e-cigs and offering them up to the kids. And then that second fold is, I'm just curious, again, trying for the prevention whether it's scaring them or what, but um, if I'm the kid that has a briefcase of the 20 e-cigs and then you have Johnny over here who has one because I sold it to him, are there different consequences? I don't know if that's how it's happening, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll speak to you real quick to, you know, more on how the kids are getting them. Uh, you know, a lot of times we see cases where there's older siblings involved that may be purchasing for a younger sibling. Or if you've got a friend that has an older sibling, they may be, uh, that may be a means to get your e-cig or your cartridges. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've encountered students that are selling them uh, on campus um, because, you know, it, they're, they're entrepreneurs, right? They're, trying to, they're doing just like Jewel. They're trying to make money. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of different, I mean, the sibling thing is a big way that they get it, or they just have a friend that looks older. Um, Honestly, sometimes mom and dad buy it for them and oh. will say that it, I don't want my kid smoking cigarettes or I don't want my kid doing this, so at least they're doing using an e-cigarette. And it, it right and that's that's how these things were marketed but let's look at the data that we're seeing and they're they're not it's it's really not so Yes, and we actually have looked at that separately. I talked about a matrix that we put together that campuses can refer to, and we do look at it separately as far as possession or distribution, and, and so consequences are going to be steeper for distribution. We have students who have been, and um, we caught them selling pods. We have students that have said, give me a dollar, and I'll give you a couple of hits. Right. Five dollars, and I'll let you use my jewel during lunch. You buy the pods, I'll buy the device, you know, things like that. It, it's, they really have a lot of energy that they can channel elsewhere. Yeah, and from a legal perspective, uh, you know, if, if we can articulate a case where there's distribution um, or sale, then it, it's a higher level offense as well. Um, so I think you kind of answered my question, but, you know, I have a recently new teenager and two years ago she came and she, she would talk about vaping and at the time she's like, oh, you know, guys do it here and there in the bathrooms. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I had to go Google it cause I didn't know. Um, but now it's become an epidemic and to learn that parents are actually, you know, distributing them to their kids kind of is shocking. But do you know how much these cost? Like, is there like a, I don't even have a clue. You so. can get yourself a jewel starter kit for $25 right now online. Wow. Yeah. Um, so the, the devices range anywhere, the device itself, right? Let's leave liquid to the second part of this. A jewel device alone is about $35. Sometimes you can find them on sale. Um, the sore and drop that I bought was $39.99 when I purchased it. And the dab pen was $15.99, $18.99, something like that. And then the liquid, the, a, a pack of four jewel pods where I've seen them recently in Walgreens and HEB down where I live is $14.99 for a pack of four. They normally run about 20 bucks. And then the liquid that you put into a, a tank based system varies based on the amount and the nicotine concentration. So for let's say a three to five milliliter bottle, you can start about 15 or $20. And then, you know, just like anything else, the more you get, the more expensive it is. 
Well, it depends on where you are. So that's why some of these kids are entrepreneurs because they need to feed their um, nicotine addiction. Um, but you use more. Uh, so the the other caveat to a lot of these nicotine liquids is they use something called nicotine salt or nick salts. And think of that like a sports drink. Like a nick salt is an electrolyte. And our body needs electrolytes in order to fire off these signals in our brains and our muscles. So the nick salts get to your brain a little bit quicker. So therefore, you're going to want it a little bit more. And you're going to want more and more of it. So is it cheaper if you just do it once? Sure. But then you look at somebody that's got a pot or a two pot a day habit and you're looking at it's way more expensive. Hey, back here. Yes. Hi. Um, so my name is Ryan Parker. I've been a vapor for nine years. Hi, Ryan Parker. I managed a vape store for two and a half years. I've had the honor and pleasure of helping hundreds of people successfully quit tobacco cigarettes. Now, are they still nicotine users? Now, they, they cut back in nicotine. So okay. usually they start based on what how much they used to smoke, how many packs a day. Uh, I've helped everyone that was between the ages of 18 to uh, my oldest was a 94-year-old uh, grandmother, uh, great-grandmother, that has been smoking for 40 years, and it was the only thing that worked for her. Sure. So I'm just going to go through this real quick. and And I'm not going to try. I'm, I'm bad at public speaking, so I apologize. I'm a little nervous. Um, you mentioned quite a bit of things, and I took some quick notes about elements in vapor being heavy metals, nickels. Mm -hmm. That's been false, been debunked. Um, can you, can that, you name they, your sources? They, they heated, yes. I actually, if you okay. would like my contact information, yeah. I have PDFs with hundreds of articles from all across the world, including the UK, where the government does state that vaping is at least 95% safer. Um, you you mentioned also on here that nicotine is a, it, the only thing more addictive than nic nicotine is heroin. Um, that is actually incorrect. Studies with lab rats show that pure nicotine, when by itself, is n it is an addictive substance, substance, but it's as addictive as sugar and caffeine, and it's about as bad for you too. In fact, there's a lot of benefits to nicotine if done in the right dosage. Um, you mentioned mods. Mods means you can change that processor. You cannot change that processor. In fact, we always recommended that people never opened up their devices. Any explosions when it came to e-cigarettes were back in the day when there were tube mods, and it was mechanical. Batteries are stored right incorrectly. Sure. So, so Ryan, the reason, the reason I, my question to this is, being in the industry, I'm incredibly mm -hmm. passionate about this industry. Sure. One of the frustrating things is the amount of fear mongering and mis misinformation that's being let out there through media. Um, it's unfortunate to see, but as educators, it is your job and it's your duty to tell the truth and do your due diligence and research. In this day and age, there's no negligence when it comes to providing correct information. So when my concern with this is everyone that's been in the vaping industry clearly does not want children to smoke. In fact, if you don't, are not a cigarette mm -hmm. smoker, we don't even recommend that you even use nicotine. We want non-smokers to stay non-smokers. Okay. It's for smokers only. Um, my question is, is, my concern essentially is if you were teaching kids this, and I can go through a list and I can provide these resources that saying mm -hmm. that majority of what you've stated over the past hour is absolutely incorrect, when these students and these kids find this information, you've lost their trust. And they, they will then go, well, if they were wrong and they lied to me about this, what else did they lie to me about? So I guess it's less of a question and more of a concern on how we can stand here and, and inform adults that have no information this, about this. So what, Ryan, what is your question? My, my question is, do you think that it is unwise to spread information and fear-mongering as a way to prevent youth vaping? As an educator, we always want to make sure that we are telling our students the truth. And so if you feel there's information out there that contradicts what we're saying here tonight, I would ask you to please send us that information because we would love to see it. The most important thing to us is making sure that we educate our students appropriately and we care about their physical health and their social emotional health. Mm -hmm.
Oh, hi. The information I put up there is fact. Uh, the, the use among uh, the e-cig re referrals that we've experienced um, have increased. So there is absolutely no denying an increase in the amount of youth using e-cigs. Hi. Uh, my question is, I see in your data that, and, and you spoke, like your program is a prevention program for uh, our little ones. Now, uh, I saw that most of the kids that are, you said it's very addictive, right, this device. So is there any organization that can help kids that are already addicted to it? Sure. So there's no um, current cessation program out there that's specific to e-cigarettes for use. The Truth Initiative is starting, uh, has partnered with the Mayo Clinic and CVS Health to do a text to quit program. They're currently in the pilot stages of that and it's, it's free to sign up. They ask you a few questions up front. Um, the other things that we are pointing people to is um, the National Jewish Health Alliance has a, a traditional nicotine-based program that they're including some e-cigarette information in, but we have yet to have a randomized controlled trial to really prove a cessation resource. If you are concerned about your child or somebody else that is addicted to nicotine, the steps that I recommend taking are talking to your pediatrician, talking to your school counselors. Frisco has really, really wonderful resources, and I'll let Aaron speak to those, on, on really helping students and helping kick addiction. And, it, and it's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not just nicotine-based products. There's, there's a whole gamut of things that their counseling services can help out with. And really opening up that line of conversation with your students. I, I mentioned uh, to some students earlier, there, there's a young person out in North Carolina who started smoking Juul when he was 15 and he was so addicted that he ended up in inpatient rehab for 40 days at the low, low price of $1,000 per day. So it's, it's a nasty, again, if you've known any smokers in your life, it's a really, really nasty habit to kick, but what, what I'm seeing when I'm reading from a lot of young people is, is they get addicted and they're scared. They are so, so scared because they don't know what to do. And sometimes they're real scared to talk to mom and dad because, ooh, are they more than likely going to be in trouble? But it's more important than ever to just open up that line of communication with your students. And I'll let Aaron talk about the resources. So something that surprised when we asked for student feedback um, about vaping was that a lot of them said, yes, you know, we're really interested in this program, but we want to learn how to quit. And something that they asked for us to do was to make sure we put posters up in every single classroom that have resources so that they have that in front of them at all times about how to quit. We have school counselors and we have student service coordinators on every campus who are there to meet with our students and to give them resources and to also help out our families. So we want our kids to come to us when they're scared like that, when they know that they want to quit, and we will, we'll, we'll send them in the right direction and we will listen to them. Uh. I'm school's record district, and uh, just like to say to the it's on or they wanted information on it has a how to quit. Thank you. So you guys mentioned an increase in the number of referrals lately, or maybe just the school year. Is the increase pretty much equal across all the schools in Frisco, or are there certain problem high schools or middle schools? 
And if that is the case, are you guys reaching out to the parents? Let's say if my child goes to school A, and that is seeing a higher percentage of increase. If I can be informed about that, maybe I can be a little bit more proactive talking to my kid. Uh, we don't need specifics, but if we can get an overall uh, generic information, uh, that would really help us out. Thank you. So we do track the e-cig referrals by campus. So each each uh, school resource officer uh, keeps statistics on the things that they do on their campus. And so um, I, I don't have the exact numbers per campus off the top of my head. Uh, I can tell you we can look at that. And certainly uh, if we saw one campus that was way higher than others, uh, then you know we would we would make sure that the SRO worked with the principal. Um, for some communication out to the parents just uh, just to be aware. But uh, we'll certainly look and see if there's one that stands out. Off the top of my head, I don't believe so. I think it's across the district. I think it's pretty level across the district. Um, it's just higher this year so far than it has been in previous uh, school years. I'll just add to that from the district perspective. We're not seeing trends on any particular campuses more. It's, it really is. It's as, as widespread as it is across the nation. Where it's pretty much just like that in Frisco. Well, I hope you guys um, learned a lot. I know I did. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you, speakers, Patricia, uh, Deputy ah, deputies. <laughs> Shilson and Ms. Miller, thank you. Um, I feel much better that uh, Frisco ISD is being proactive about this. And um, thank you for coming. This concludes our program tonight.